Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Are you ready to conquer the whole known world? We're here. here. Of course, you have to be less than 34 years old. Uh, to paraphrase someone uh, who once said this about Mozart, by the time Alexander the Great was my age, he'd been dead for 24 years. Um, he died at 33, but today we're going to talk about the life of Alexander the Great. Before I get into that, I promised I would do this. Each of the next classes, if you did not bring a pen before, um, if, as, when we get back, as soon as we have an opportunity to get these videos up, if there are any you did not see, then they will be at our website, the liteachapala.org, so make a note of that. And my website, uh, or my email address is here, so if you need to reach me for something or have a problem accessing or whatever, just let me know. Today we are looking at Alexander the Great and Hellenism. We're going to focus mostly on Alexander the Great. And then Hellenism is the movement that really came out of uh, the aftermath of Alexander the Great's conquering. But before we can talk about Alexander the Great, we have to set this up a little bit historically because there were some events <coughs> that set the stage for Alexander the Great to conquer the whole known world in the 300s BC. And around 500 BC, I mentioned today, um, Persia was the world power. We'd gone from one empire to another. Around 500 BC, Persia was the known uh, world power. And they controlled, amongst a lot of other things, all of Anatolia, as it was called then, modern-day Turkey, as we understand it. That's the part that's behind this box over here. This is what we call Turkey. It was called Anatolia in those days. But right along the coast, you will notice that there are orange parts here. This is the area called Ionia, which even though it technically was part of the property that Persia owned and controlled, the cities along that area aligned themselves with Greece. They spoke Greek, they saw themselves as part of Greek culture, they had temples to the Greek gods, so they, they thought of themselves as Greek. That had happened much earlier, around 1200 BC, when Troy, right here, was conquered by a collection of Greek city-states. We're gonna talk about that tomorrow when we talk about Mycenae. We'll get into the history or the, the legend of Troy. But the point is, these cities along here saw themselves as being part of Greece, even though they were owned by Persia. Well, around 500 BC, they rebelled against Persia. And in fact, in 498 BC, we had the Battle of Ephesus. Ephesus, where we visited, oh gosh, was it two months ago now? <laughs> um, that was, right outside the city of Ephesus was where a battle was held, and the battle caused Persia to say, we need to step on the necks of these Ionian cities who are trying to rebel against us. And because Greece was supporting them in that, we need to step on Greece. So they sent an army over, and, and uh, in the process, they um, first crossed over into Greece. And they were, to everyone's surprise, because Greece was not one country. They were city-states. But at the Battle of Marathon, uh, in 490 BC, to everyone's shock and amazement, the Greeks won a battle against the Persian army. Marathon is right here. Well, it's 26 miles from where the battle was held to the city of Athens. And um, very famously, a messenger ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to tell them we've won the battle, and then he fell over dead. And that's why Today, a marathon is run that is 26 miles. And trust me, if I ran a 26-mile marathon, I would fall over dead. But that was the first part of the Greek, of the Persian Wars, as they're called, because they we talk about them from the Greek perspective. Later on, the Greeks came back, and they, instead of crossing over by sea, because they had a big army, they went up, crossed the narrow part, and then marched down, and they came through a narrow pass at uh, Thermopylae. How many of you saw the movie 300? Right, rippling abs, right? Remember that part? <laughs> uh, the movie 300 is a fictionalized version of the Battle of Thermopylae. We're in a very narrow pass. 300 Spartans, who were the best soldiers that they had on all of, all of the Greek city-states, and quite a few other you know, thespians and Thebans and others, fought the, Greek, the uh, Persian army to a standstill. They eventually got through, the Persian army did, they came down and they ended up sacking Athens. In fact, the, the Athenians fled the city, the Persians burned the city, and then later on, and there, there was an oracle from Delphi, I'm getting into tomorrow's, tomorrow's talk, anyway, there ended up being a war where the Greeks were being defeated on land, but they had created a navy 
and they succeeded in defeating the Persian navy at the Battle of Salamis, right here. This is the Bay of Salamis. And the Persians were defeated and sent packing back home. We'll get into a little more detail, but the bottom line for all of that is the Greeks hated the Persians. And likewise, the Persian didn't care much for the Greeks either. But the Greeks had this animosity for the Persians. Actually, after all of this happened, we got into the, the Golden Age of Greece, which was the, the period of Pericles, that's him in the funny hat, here. Pericles, who was the leader of Athens, when Athens became the most powerful city-state, and they actually created a league, we'll talk about the Delian League, which became the Athenian Empire. Um, it was the time in which they built the its celebration because Athens had been burned. They rebuilt the city and they built the uh, Parthenon and the other temples on the Acropolis of Athens, which is this part. They also created beautiful temples in other parts of the city and other areas. It was a time of great art, the Golden Age, which only lasted about 40 years or so. But the Golden Age of Greece. But still, there was always this sense of animosity against the Persians for having burned Athens in the first place. And this all sort of built up and built up and built up. Well, we now come to um, the 300s and the period of the man that this morning I call the most underrated leader or figure in all of history, Philip II. Now, Macedon, let me back up one, or one or two here. Macedon or Macedonia, either one is proper, is up here. It was its own country. It was different than Greece, even though Greece wasn't a country, Greece was a collection of city-states. But Macedon was mostly herders, mostly people who herded sheep, and a few warlords, you know, who would you know, take over a village and, you know, th think they were big shots for a while. There were other countries, um, Epirus, uh, Thessaly, Illyria, uh, Thrace, all of them had their own languages, their own, even though primitive, cultures. They were not Greeks although they tended to speak the Greek language along with their local language. Well, man comes along, and that's him here and here, Philip II of Macedon. Philip II of Macedon was a diplomat. He was a strategist, a soldier, a tactician. He was cultivated. He took over control of Macedon, and the first thing he did was decide he was going to tur turn it into a major world power. Okay, they didn't even have any cities in, this, in Macedon. The, the best they had was villages. He, the capital was Pella, whoops, Pella, which we looked at a second ago. <laughs> this is Pella. Well, Philip II of Macedon takes Pella and he brings in all sorts of Grecian architects, um, artists, philosophers, all kinds of people, and he builds Pella into a world-class city. Now, he paid for it by stealing some silver mines in Amphipolis, further up north that had belonged to the Athenians. The Athenians had used those silver mines to fund their growth, but Philip took them away from the Athenians and used that silver to build Pella into a great city. He, as I say, he brought teachers and philosophers, very smart guy. He started a school based upon Greek philosophy and the Greek classics and invited all of the children of all of the Macedonian sort of warlord leaders and surrounding nations to come to this school in Pella free. Everybody thought it was a good idea, not realizing that what he was doing was he was raising the next generation of people that would be loyal to Macedon. His own son, Alexander, was a student in this school, so all of these, these other students from around the region came there and they became close friends with Alexander. I'll talk about Alexander in a minute. In fact, they became to be called the Companions, with a capital C. Well, Philip, after he builds up this the city of Pella and the region, he then creates an army. And this army is quite something. The, it was a professional army, full-time, and that was unheard of with the exception of Sparta. Sparta had a full-time army. Every place else, they were citizen soldiers, sort of like the National Guard used to be. You know, one week in a month, one month a year. And they would, they would come and fight when there was battle needed. Otherwise, they, they were at home. But... Philip, like the Spartans, had a professional army. They were full-time. He paid them. And he trained them very, very hard. He created a special kind of phalanx. Now, the Greeks and others had used phalanxes before. He increased the size of this phalanx, and he introduced something, which you see here, which was called a sarissa. 
it was a spear that was between 12 and 15 feet long. Everybody else's spears were six feet long. What did that mean when you run into a bunch of guys like this if they had those spears and you've got one six feet long? And he designed it so that they could, that, you know, they were very disciplined, they could part, other guys could come forward. He also introduced um, divisions of the military. Previously, uh, it, it was very simple. They had phalanxes, pretty much it. He introduced cavalry, not just occasional leaders like generals on horses, but organized groups of cavalrymen. And while there's some dispute about this, it may very well be that at this time, the stirrup was invented. Uh, whether or not Philip did it, we don't know. But it may have been that his cavalry was so much more effective because they could actually control the horse instead of just trying to you know, hold, it, hold on with their knees while they shot with a bow. He also created light skirmishers, archer divisions. He had both light and heavy cavalry, a very organized modern army. Well, this, this Philip from this backwater Macedon created this military force and promptly proceeded to conquer every every of one of these countries around him. Thrace, Illyria, he, he was also a diplomat. He married uh, a woman who was high up in the nobility of Epirus, one of the other uh, next to them uh, close by countries, his wife Olympias. She was the mother of Alexander. And so after conquering all of those surrounding countries, he then succeeded in conquering Greece, which means the city-states like Athens and others. And Philip, of all things from this backwater Macedon, set his sights on conquering the big prize, which was Persia. Now, Philip didn't actually think he could conquer Persia, since they stretched from the, you know, the edge of the Ionian cities all the way to the Persian Gulf. All right? That would have been a little too much for him to bite off. But he was already developing the strategy to at least take part of Asia Minor, when unfortunately he was assassinated. Unfortunate for him. Um, he was at a wedding, and one of his own bodyguards, Pausanias, stabbed him and killed him, and then as Pausanias was trying to escape, two of Alexander's close friends caught him and killed him. Well, one of the, because he was killed by Alexander's friends, they think, some people think, Pausanias may have been hired by Olympias and her son Alexander to kill, to kill, Pausan, to kill uh, Philip so that they could guarantee that Alexander would come to power. Because along the way, Olympias, who had been the wife of Philip, had been set aside, and he had married a much younger, beautiful woman named Cleopatra. Not that Cleopatra. <laughs> Different Cleopatra. A Cleopatra who was a full Macedonian woman. And in fact, when they had the wedding between Cleopatra and Philip, Cleopatra's uncle, Attalus, who was quite a well-known warlord, announced openly it was good that he was marrying a Macedonian woman so that he could have a real son and not a bastard like Alexander standing over there in the corner because his mother was from a different country. And Alexander heard this and he threw a cup at Attalus and uh, his father Philip, who was drunk, jumped up, grabbed his sword and ran toward him, fell on his face. And so Alexander mocked him lying there drunk on the floor, which created some problems later because the generals were very loyal to Philip. He had created the army, but they also were loyal to Alexander. When Philip was killed, uh, was assassinated, uh, his son takes over and Olympias makes sure that there's no competition from Cleopatra and her young son by burning them alive. Ooh. It was a rough world back then. Alexander then, who's only 16 years old, orders the, the, the assassination or the murder of the very self, anybody else who could have been a, a successor of his. Now, you need to understand, let me talk about Alexander a little bit, but when Alexander was 12 years old, he tamed a wild stallion named Bucephalus. Well, he named it Bucephalus. This wild stallion, nobody else could tame it. Nobody else could, could do anything with this horse, and they were going to get rid of it. And Alexander, it's a, I was reminded of this a little while ago, uh, a little piece of the puzzle, the story goes that Alexander noticed that Bucephalus was afraid of his shadow, this, this stallion. And so he says, I can, I can tame him. Twelve years old. He says, I can break this horse. And they go, okay. His father, Philip, said, well, give it a try. Well, when Alexander got on Bucephalus, he rode him toward the sun so that the horse couldn't see his shadow. And went as far as he could, turned and came back. And by that time, Bucephalus had begun to, you know, when a horse is broken, it breaks pretty quickly. 
And Eucephalus became uh, his horse from that point till almost the end of his campaign. Eucephalus is killed late in the, in the campaign in India. He was his favorite horse. He, he rode him everywhere in every major battle. When Bucephalus was finally killed in India, he mourned, Alexander mourned that horse and um, founded a city named Bucephalia. Named him after his horse. Named it after his horse. Well, at 12 he broke this horse. At the age of 13, Philip hires a tutor for Alexander. Not just any tutor. He hired Aristotle to come up from Athens to be tutor for three years to Alexander. This helped him become great. At the age of 16, while Philip is out, you know, making sure that everybody is, is in line, towing the line in terms of these other countries, he's off in Thrace making sure that they're completely conquered. He leaves his 16-year-old son as regent in charge of Macedon and all the other properties. Well, while Philip is away, his 16-year-old son Alexander is running things. A group, a tribal group from Thrace, tries to cross the border, raiding. Well, 16-year-old Alexander summons the army, gets on Bucephalus, rides out, whips up on these people. In fact, chases them all the way back to their capital city and conquers it and has it renamed Alexanderopolis. <laughs> he was 16 yeah, when he did sure. that now. Um, obviously not your ordinary kid. Well, at 16 after this event was when Philip is assassinated. Alexander becomes king of Macedon. The soldiers support him. I should also mention that when Alexander had, had attacked Greece at one of the major battles, the Battle of Chironia, Chironia, that Alexander had commanded one whole attack wing of the cavalry, and he was given credit for winning the battle as a teenager. He was quite something. Um, this is what Thrace looked like when, uh, or I'm sorry, what, what Macedon and the surrounding areas looked like. This is Greece. This is Macedon, Thrace, etc. This is Epirus. That they were allies because Olympias had come from there, and so all of Greece and all of the surrounding countries were under Philip's control. When Philip died, they tried to rebel. Immediately, Alexander, as a teenager, takes the army, quells the rebellion immediately, in very rough manner, like uh, the the Thebans, the city of Thebes. They resisted, they, they went in their city and locked them out. He conquered the city, killed 7,000 people, and sold 30,000 more into slavery. He was not messing around. At that point, Alexander the Great decides he is going to fulfill his father's dream of going over to Persia. And so he launches out, he crosses, he takes his army, prepares them. They cross over the area known as the Hellespot. More images of Alexander, as I said earlier, Apparently that's what he looked like because there are several statues that were carved of him during his life and they all look pretty much like this. So he, as I said today, he apparently was loved by women and men alike. He engendered, uh, he was large, he was athletic, he was charismatic, he engendered a lot of loyalty. His companions, the, the guys he had grown up with, as well as the generals that had been his father's generals, would die for him and they proved that. And so he had this extraordinary charisma. Um, as he went along. These are various images. I'm going to come to this one again later. That actually is a mosaic from Pompeii that they uncovered when they dug it out. This is uh, Alexander here, and this is Darius the Great. I'm going to show you a, a, a revised version of that where they filled in some of the gaps in a few minutes. So Alexander decides he is going to fulfill his father's dream and go over and take part of Persia. And so he crosses in uh, 334, he crosses over into, if I'm not very careful, I push the wrong button here. He crosses over into Asia Minor, or Anatolia, as it was called in ancient times. Soon, and as he was pulling up to the shore, by the way, he stands out on the bow of the ship and he takes his spear as the ship is just approaching the shore, and he throws his spear and, it, and sticks it into the beach in Asia Minor, he leaps from the boat and goes out, pulls the spear out and holds it up and shouts so all of his men on the ships as they're landing can hear him and he says, by the Macedonian spear, Asia will be ours. 
He really had a flair for the dramatic on top of everything else. So they start into um, Asia Minor, and the first thing that they run into is a group of the Persian satraps. The satrap was a local governor. The local governors, the satraps of Asia Minor, had gotten together and decided they're going to oppose him at a, a river called the Granicus. Well, the Granicus is the first great battle. There are four, uh, there are a lot of battles, but four great battles that uh, Alexander fought. Alexander is considered one of the greatest military geniuses in history. His, his tactics, well, strategies and tactics, are still studied at West Point and other major military training schools. Uh, he broke all the rules, and yet he did so. He never lost a battle. He was never defeated in battle. Even though when he crossed over into Asia Minor, he had about, the scholars differ, about 35,000 soldiers. He had a few more, but they were Greeks, and they were mostly along as hostages, because with them along, some of the, their comrades back home would be less likely to rebel, you know, because he conquered those areas first. Well, they cross, cross over to Isis, or the Granicus, I'm sure, sorry. Granicus is the first battle that they fight. Alexander is outnumbered about two to one, and yet... Um, he, as he always did, charged. All right. He very seldom waited at all. There's only one battle, the Battle of Gogamela, where he hesitated, and he did it for several reasons. One, because his his soldiers at Gogamela. I'll tell you that in a minute. That's the Gogamela story. Here at um, at Granicus, he charged immediately when he arrived on the scene. He sent his troops out into the wings, charged across a river several times. In battles, he would attack across a river. Any of you guys have any military training, men or women? You don't cross a river in the face of an army which is twice your size. Well, he did, and he won. In fact, not only did he never lose a battle, Alexander never fought an army that was not bigger than his. Uh, and in some cases, many, many times bigger than his. Um, he won the Battle of Granicus, and so had sort of given notice that I'm here and we are going to take this seriously. Uh, this is there's a lot of imagery. In fact, Alexander became a favorite subject of sculpture and painting and relief everywhere, like the thing from Pompeii. All right, the Romans, every conqueror or anybody who even imagined themselves to be conqueror after that pictured themselves as a reincarnation of Alexander the Great. Hannibal did, Napoleon did, Julius Caesar did. They all saw themselves as being heirs to the conquering spirit of Alexander. And there's artwork about Alexander all over um, Europe and the Near East. So this is, this is one painting of the Battle of the Granicus. Well, after the Battle of the Granicus, he goes south along the Ionian coast. Now, interesting thing is, you remember I told you that the Greeks hated the Persians. Well, now the Greeks also hate the Macedonians because the first thing that Philip had done and then his son had done is conquer Greece. And so these Ionian cities along the coast were some of the most difficult battles that Philip had because he had to defeat the Greeks. A lot of the Greeks joined with Darius, who was the, the king of Persia, fighting against um, Alex, Alexander as he was going along. Well, he travels throughout winning battles throughout all of Asia Minor, and finally, he comes to the city of Isis, which in the north, um, the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea, not too far from Tarsus, where Paul of, you know, Saul of Tarsus came from. So they get to the city of Isis, and this time Darius, the king of Persia, who is called the king of kings, the king of all lands, he decides, okay, I'm going to deal with this upstart Macedonian myself. So he shows up against um, about 40,000 troops at this point because he'd got some reinforcements that Alexander has. He shows up with an army of about 100,000. Sounds pretty easy. Well, at the Battle of Isis, once again, there's a river. And once again, Alexander the Great charges them across the river. The thing is, uh, Darius was there. And Darius is sitting in his chariot. And he's sitting back behind the forces. Well, when Alexander sees Darius, Alexander leads the charge, the cavalry charge, right up the middle, right toward Darius. The uh, Persian ranks break. Darius is frightened to death. And he turns and runs away. Uh, and all of the Persian army is demoralized 
when he runs away, and therefore, why is there a blank slide in there? Oh, uh, therefore, here's here Darius himself has been defeated. We have you in this picture. This is Alexander the Great, and you'll notice all of his forces are going that way. This is Darius, and you'll notice all of his forces are going that way too. <laughs> Because Darius was so frightened, he turned and ran. And when he ran, he ran so fast, he left behind his whole baggage train, including his mother and his wife and his daughter, who were captured by Alexander. Alexander treated them with great respect as being royal. Um, and at that point, um, between there and Tyre, Alexander received a letter from Darius, and he says, I will give you, if you will turn and go back to Macedon, I will give you pretty much all of Asia Minor. I will give you a huge amount of money, and I promise I will never attack Greece or do anything against you again, if you'll just leave. Alexander writes back to him and says, next time you write to me, you call me King of Kings, because we are not peers. I am the king of Asia. You are not. So even though he treats his family with respect, Alexander makes it very clear that he did not consider himself, or he did not consider Darius, the great king, the king of kings, to be his equal. Um, oh, and by the way, Parmenius was probably the best, the most, the greatest of the generals. He had been under Philip, he's now under Alexander, and when this letter, this you know, this messenger comes from Darius and says, I will give you all this land and all this money. I won't bother you ever again. Um, and Alexander says, no. Parmenius says, you know, if I were you, Alexander, I would have taken that deal. And Alexander says, well, if I were Parmenius, I would have too. No. Get it? Alexander believed that he was more than human. In fact, his mother, Olympias, had suggested to him that before, um, that while she was married to Philip, that Zeus, remember the Greek gods, would sometimes have intercourse with humans? Children like Hercules was half god, half human? Well, Olympia suggested very early to her son that perhaps he was the son of Zeus. And the more battles he won, the more invincible he seemed, the more Alexander started to believe that too. Well, from the Battle um, of Isis, he goes south to Tyre. Now, most of the cities along the Phoenician coast gave in to him right away. I mean, they'd heard what's coming, they gave up. He gets down to Tyre, and Tyre <coughs> refuses to submit. Tyre was an unusual situation. There was the old city of Tyre, but the new city of Tyre, which was entirely fortified, and some ancient writers, and this is probably too much to believe, they claim that the walls of Tyre were 150 feet high. Probably not that much, but still pretty awesome. It was on an island. The new city of Tyre, entirely fortified, huge fortress on an island about a half a mile, 800 meters out from the shore. No way to get there. And so all the Tyrian soldiers are sitting up there going, Neener, 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 you're not so hot, Alexander. Well, Alexander wasn't going to take that. So he tears down the old city of Tyre, which is on the coast, and he takes the rubble, and he starts building a causeway, or what's called a mole. He builds a causeway over a half a mile long and over a hundred yards wide. Well, the closer he gets to the city of Tyre, they've got, you know, they're flinging stones and shooting arrows and the whole thing. He builds siege engines. They build, they build this causeway all the way out, and as they're getting close, he decides, okay, you know, I don't really have a navy, but we're going to need a navy to get around on the other side of this island fortress. So he went and got one. <laughs> he went down the coast, and again, the Persians were still... He, Alexander controlled much of Persian Empire by that point, but they still had a powerful navy. And in fact, the Greek states back home kept hoping that the Persian navy would invade Greece, because if they did that, they hoped that Alexander would have to turn around and come back to defend Macedon and Greece and the other places, and that would free them up, you know, they wouldn't be a threat anymore. Well, in order to keep that from happening, he didn't have a navy to take the Persian navy, you know, to defeat the Persian navy, so he took all their naval bases. They had no place to land, 
they had no place to resupply because their bases were all along this eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Well, when he conquered all of their bases, most of the Persian Navy just said, okay, what do you want us to do? We're yours now. And so he conquered the Navy by taking away their bases. He took part of those ships, came back up, and used them to assault um, the city of Tyre. When he conquered the city of Tyre, he killed, I think it was 10,000 people, and sold everybody else into slavery. The message was very clear. If cities or areas submitted and gave in to him, he would actually let whoever was in charge, whoever the governor was, continue to run their business. But if a city like Tyre refused and, ref and refused to let him in, they paid horrible consequences. So he went on down the coast. He ended up, um, Gaza gave him some trouble, the city in Gaza. He conquered them, and he went on down to Egypt. Let me see if I've got another slide after this one. I think I do. Okay. He went on down south to Egypt. Well, when he came into Egypt, Egypt has been under Persian control too, and they hated it. And so they welcomed him as a liberator. In fact, they named him Pharaoh. You remember that the Pharaohs were considered divine. All right? They were related to the god Horus. Well, they announced that he's the Pharaoh, that he is divine, and, and Alexander's going, I thought so. All right? <laughs> right there with you. In fact, he makes, because he thought he was the son of Zeus, that there was a, a, a god, Amun-Ra, and the Greeks that had been connected or had visited uh, Egypt had connected that to Zeus, Amun Zeus, because Zeus was the high god as Ra for the Greeks, as Ra was the high god for the Egyptians. So uh, Amun Zeus, Alexander, thinking he was the son of Zeus and being declared a god by the Pharaoh by the Egyptians, goes out into the desert to the temple, which is a dangerous trip out into the desert. And there was an oracle there at the temple of. Um, Amun Zeus or Amun Ra, he goes in and the oracle there declares that he is the son of Zeus and that he will be the conqueror of the whole world. And so, of course, Alexander comes out and went, thought so. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought. And that's why you see on this map, this little jog out here, that's where the temple of Amun Zeus or Amun Ra was, where he got confirmation that he was divine. Later on, this created real problems because when he conquered the Persia, all the rest of Persia, they were okay with bowing down, literally face down to the ground, to the rulers. The king of kings, they call their, their Persian king. And um, Alexander thought that was a pretty good deal. The problem was that the Macedonians, who were still his generals and his closest companions, to, um, to drop yourself on your face was a sign of worship not of admiration for a king, but of worship of a god. Well, again, Alexander thought that was very appropriate, but his Macedonians, who had known him since he was grasshopper, did not think that was a good idea. And he had real problems with that. But he leaves Egypt, he comes back up to Tyre, and then he starts back across the rest of the Persian Empire. He comes to the city of Galgamela. Galgamela, all of this time that he's been conquering Tyre, and he spent um, quite a long time down in Egypt, and he comes back up. This whole time, Darius has been saying, I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen again. And he has been raising an army. He's been hiring mercenaries from all sorts of different places, including a lot more Greeks. He has an army, which is considered to probably have been at least 250,000. Some ancient estimates were as many as a million. Probably not that high, but somewhere in there is truth. Alexander had about 45,000. So Darius is absolutely sure. I know how this one's going to end, right? As, and plus, uh, Darius has done what a very smart general does. He had picked a place for the battle, a place with a big open plain where his superior numbers were going to be more effective. Remember, the Persians had been stopped by 300 uh, Spartans and a bunch of thespians. That doesn't mean actors. That means they were from, you know, the... Anyway, uh, so because of a narrow place. Well, Darius, big wide open plain around Galgamela, lots of room for my people to spread out to surround him, conquer him. I'm going to get rid of this Alexander. He's not so great after all. Alexander comes up and he approaches at the end of the day. Every other instance when Alexander would approach the enemy, he would attack them immediately. This time he stopped and he's just looking around, okay? He's outnumbered more than five to one at least. 
And his, his soldiers, his generals, tells him he should attack at night. Go at night where we can take advantage. You know, he won't have as much advantage from big numbers. Well, Alexander refuses. He says, no, I'm not going to attack him at night. I'm going to attack him in the daytime because when I beat him, I want him to know that he can never raise an army against me again. Because if I beat him in daylight, with the odds being better than 5 to 1, then he is going to be truly and thoroughly beaten. So the next day, they set up, they, they set up their lines. Again, outnumbered more than 5 to 1. And also, Darius thought, okay, he had a secret weapon. Remember I told you before that chariots were the tanks of the ancient world? Well, somebody had given Darius the smart idea to take a bunch of chariots and put swords on. You, you saw Ben-Hur? Okay, Darius came up with that idea, and he thought, I will drive these chariots through the Macedonian lines and just cut them up. Well, uh, Alexander saw it coming. So when the lines, when they lined up and Darius sends his sword chariots forward, the Macedonians just step aside and let them run through, and when they get past them, they spear them in the back. Okay. Um, not so smart, Darius. You didn't have a second plan. Okay, you thought it was going to... Well, once again, they charge forward, and uh, Alexander sees Darius, because, you know, kings fought with their armies back then. He attacks directly at Darius. Once again, Darius runs away. And in running away, again, his soldiers are demoralized, and the 45, 40, 45,000 or so soldiers of Alexander defeat an army that was at least 250,000. Darius starts running and doesn't stop. He keeps running. And Alexander, after defeating this army, he moves forward. He, he marches into Persepolis, which was the capital at that time. He destroys, burns the, um, the palace in Persepolis, later on burns the whole city. He conquers the major cities of Persia, the center of the Persian Empire. He now truly is the king of kings, the king of all Persia, of Greece, of Egypt, of pretty much every place. But he keeps going. He keeps moving forward. And by the way, a little while later, he's, he's chasing Darius to make sure that this is over. He finally catches up with Darius's coach days and days later by the roadside and finds Darius's dead body in it. One of, one of his governors, his satraps, had murdered Darius for running away twice in the face of the enemy. And so they find his dead body. Alexander gives Darius a royal funeral after all of this. Again, he treated his family with respect and returned them. He gave Darius a royal funeral, and then he went hunting for the guy that killed him. And sometime later, his name was Bessus, he caught Bessus, and he tried him and executed him for the murder of Darius, who had been Alexander's great enemy. Okay, So a very different kind of attitude there. As he continues to travel east, he bypasses Persia. He starts over into India. Bactria, you've heard of Bactrian camels? Okay, this is where they come from. Bactria, various parts of what we know of as India. He has some trouble with his, uh, his soldiers because... A big goal for uh, Alexander was to make one empire. So he started wearing Persian clothes, which the Macedonians did not like. He started, uh, he married a, a woman from eastern Persia, Roxanne, which his soldiers didn't like. He then insisted that his generals marry Persian women, which they did not want to do. And, and he took um, 30,000 Persian youths raised them for a couple of years, taught them the Macedonian military techniques, um, taught them what it was, taught them Greek, and convinced them that they were now part of his army and prepared them to be part of the army. There was a real effort by Alexander to create one people, one empire. The problem was all of his generals, who had most of whom had been generals under his father, they loved being Macedonians. They still had that sort of rough and ready kind of frontier attitude. And they thought this Persian thing was kind of sissy. And they were not interested in this. They didn't want to marry. They, they obeyed Alexander, but from time to time they gave him problems. For instance, one night, and heavy drinking was part of their culture. They'd get drunk at nights. 
One night, they all get very drunk, and Black Cletus, he was called. Cletus had been the bodyguard of Alexander when he was a child. He was the, one of the closest friends of his father, Philip. Well, Black Cletus, one night, they're all in their cups, he starts uh, giving Alexander a hard time for thinking he's a god, which he says is stupid, and also for having um, said bad things about his father, Philip. Remember, he mocked his father when he fell drunk at his feet? And Alexander, also very drunk, they would get drunk all the time, jumps up, grabs a spear from a bodyguard, and runs Cletus through. One of his oldest and closest friends had been his own guard when he was youth. Now, after he did it, I'm sure when he sobered up, Alexander was just mortified. He, he grieved over having done this in anger. But he had quite a few instances like that. Um, there was a, because they didn't, the Macedonians didn't like a lot of what Alexander was doing at this point. They didn't like the fact he was thinking he was divine. There was a, a plot, apparently, to assassinate him. And it turns out uh, Philotus, one of the sort of junior generals, uh, was found to be involved in that. He was tried and executed. Well, well his father, Philotus' father, was Parmenius, one of the number one generals, and the one that he'd relied on most. He was the one that said, if, I were, if I'd been Alexander, I'd taken that deal. And Alexander said, well, I would have taken it too if I were Parmenius. But still, he was one of his best generals. After his, Parmenius' son, Philotus, was found guilty and executed, um, Alexander also had his father, Parmenius, killed because he thought he would then be, create a problem. Well, all of this is creating some tension and stuff as they're going along. They get into Asia, and we get to the fourth great battle, and that was a battle that was very different than anything else he had done. Um, this battle, uh, which you can see here is uh, the Battle of Hydaspus, or Hydaspus. Um, once again, he fought across a river. In fact, it was raining, the banks were slippery, and the, the Indian army, this was under a King Porus. King Porus was the most powerful of all the Indian rulers, and he had a secret weapon. It wasn't too secret, because you couldn't miss it. He had war elephants. The Macedonians had never even seen an elephant, much less a war elephant. They show up at the river. It's raining. The banks are slippery. The Indian army sort of relaxes a little bit, because they say, well, they're not going to do anything as long as the conditions are like this. What do you think Alexander did? He charged across the river. Actually, he fainted right and charged left so that he got most of his guys across the river before they realized what was going on. They attacked, and again, being very smart, sort of like what he did with the, the chariots uh, that Darius had, instead of trying to fight these elephants head on, how do you fight a war elephant head on? They sort of got out of the way and let the elephants you know, get up amongst them. They started jabbing the elephants, which made them crazy, and the elephants started rampaging. And then while that was happening, they're shooting arrows at the guys who were riding the elephants, and they defeated them that way. They defeated Porus, but he respected Porus, this Indian general, so much he let him continue to rule his kingdom. But after conquering India, this is an image of the war elephants. Um, uh, after conquering the, la the fourth great battle, you'll notice the arrow here after this battle. Alexander wanted to continue going further to the east. He wanted to go to the Great Sea. And that was the point at which his generals, who remember had been, get, had been getting more and more frustrated with Alexander thinking his divine, not acting like a Macedonian, making them do things they didn't want to do, even though they were loyal to him, they said, Al, 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 no more. We don't want to go any further. Let's go home. Alexander, it said, was so upset with them, he went in his tent and pouted for three days. <laughs> remember, he's still, you know, 30 years old. He's still pretty young. Uh, and not used to not getting his own way. So they decided they would not continue on. Um, they ended up heading south along the, uh, the Indus and Hydrastus rivers. In fact, what they did, and this gives you an idea that, you know, well, let's just do it. They're, don't take no for an answer. They decided it'd be easier to ride down the rivers than it would be to walk down the rivers, and so they built boats. Right there, built boats transported all their goods. Some of them still march along the riverside. They get down to the south, down to the sea, because he said, I'm at least going to go down to the ocean. You know, if I can't go to the far sea, I'm going to go to the Indian Ocean. They got there, and then they said, okay, let's head back west. We'll head back west. The problem is, there was the Gedrosian Desert, which is a horrendous desert, which is um, just north of the Indian Sea, um, 
they crossed this desert, thousands of them died. It was summertime. And so thousands of his troops died. They finally got across this horrible desert. And they ended up returning to some of the locations they'd been before. When they got to Susa, Susa had been the main capital of the Persian Empire. They settle in there. He was planning at that time to make Babylon his capital. Okay. Um, because he'd been there, the history of Babylon. At Susa, they're all partying hardy, and uh, he has more insists on more of his people marrying the Persian wives. After a long night of partying, he falls ill with a fever. He gets sicker and sicker. First, he loses the ability to walk. Then he loses the ability to talk. The Macedonians see that he is not going to make it, and so they file past him for one last glimpse at his leader, at their leader. He did not have any heirs. He did not have any sons. And so there are, all of his generals are around him saying, what do you want us to do if you die, Alexander? What happens then? Who do you want to be your successor? And he may have said Craterus, which was one of his generals. Or he may have said Crateroi, which means to the strongest. Well, the generals who were around him, Craterus wasn't there right then. They all assumed he said to the strongest, uh, strongest, Crateroi. And he dies. At that point starts what's called the War of the Diadochi. Now, this is what his empire looked like. Just under 11 years of, cam of campaigning, well, 10 years of campaigning, because he, he had some time after he became king while he was still in, in the... So from this area, the Aegean Sea, all the way across to India, Egypt, and pretty much everything in between, he had conquered. Almost the whole known world at that point. Known world in terms of what the Greeks knew anything about. Along the way, he had been planting cities all along. In, e in Egypt, for instance, he had a city planted right in the, the uh, delta, which he named Alexandria. In fact, he was sort of like George Foreman. You know George Foreman had, yeah. has a number of sons, and he named them all George Foreman? <laughs> well, everywhere he went, other than Bucephalia, um, he founded cities, and in almost every case, he named them Alexandria. You've got Alexandria of Parthia, and Alexandria of this, and Alexandria of that, but he named most of the cities after himself. But he founded cities all over the empire as he conquered it. When he died, his generals looked at each other and said, what are we going to do now? Well, each of them was thinking in their mind, well, I'm the strongest. And the others are thinking, no, I'm the strongest. No, I'm the strongest. At that point, um, the first one to stop calling himself a governor or satrap was Antigonus Monothalamus. 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 That's hard to pronounce. Monothalamus, meaning one eye. And he claimed that he was the new king. Well, all the other generals ganged up against him. And so they ended up with nine generals fighting it out. Pretty quickly it got down to five, but only three of them mattered for much. I mentioned that this morning. Um, Two of them, Cassander and Lysimachus, ended up controlling Greece and Thrace and Macedon, the original area they had come from, which was a very small part of the empire at that point. But Ptolemy ended up taking sort of the prize, the jewel, well, because of the ancient history there, and that was Egypt, and Egypt was quite wealthy. Seleucus, who had actually been a junior general until this war happened, and it went on for 30 years, these guys were fighting, all right? Uh, Seleucus ended up getting um, Iran, Iraq, and the parts of India. And the, the uh, Antigonus ended up with Syria and most of Asia Minor. Well, over a period of time, they continued to fight each other. Or, and their descendants continued to fight each other. And so it ended up, the Antigonid Empire ended up being pushed back up into Macedonia. Um, the Ptolemaic Empire was here, but Seleucus, who'd been the most junior of all of the major generals, ended up conquering most of Asia Minor as well as Mesopotamia and that area. Now, they continued to fight about this. They continued to take land from each other. Uh, and this went on and on until the only thing that stopped 
the descendants of the, uh, the generals of Alexander from continuing to fight each other was the Roman Empire. Rome came in and everybody stopped fighting each other because Rome ended up taking over. They took over Macedonia, Greece, and be, this is where they just had begun to take over Asia Minor. Eventually, they controlled all of this. Okay, eventually, that was the Roman Empire. Later on, it was divided into East and West. Now, it's very important to realize, Alexander was not Greek. He was Macedonian. But he had been taught Greek culture. His mentor was Aristotle, one of the greatest of the Greek philosophers. His, the Greek culture and art, his father had, had really... Um, lifted that up as being the height of civilization in order to try to get Macedon out of the Dark Ages and make it a real power. And so this is what Alexander had learned. So everywhere he went in the empire, he shared the Greek culture. The Greek language became the universal language. That's why the New Testament is written in Greek, even though the writers, with the exception of Luke, were all you know uh, Hebrews. They were all Jewish. And so their original language would have been Hebrew, or Aramaic was the common language, because Aramaic was a, was a Babylonian language they'd learned during the Babylonian exile. But Greek was the universal language. Everybody spoke Greek. You want to communicate with somebody, didn't matter what other language they started with, they spoke Greek too. That's because of Alexander. When they divided up the Roman Empire, they divided it into East and West. The Eastern Empire, most of it, in effect, had been the part that was made Greek by Alexander the Great. Later on, when you got all of the influence from um, the Byzantine Empire, it's all Greek. How did it get to be Greek? It got to be Greek because Alexander made it all Greek. And so, um, this the Eastern Empire under Justinian. They took the Greek culture that had been inspired and spread by Alexander and spread it through most of the rest of the Mediterranean Basin. When they split Eastern and Western Christianity, it was split, split pretty closely along the lines of the Eastern part being what Alexander had conquered. And so there's a huge significance for uh, a thousand, well, 1,300 years after Alexander, his influence continued to be felt. And every major military leader or conqueror or dictator or king since has had had at least a little and often a lot of an inclination that maybe they could be like Alexander. Okay. Um, very significant historically. Any questions? I was promising I wasn't going to run late tonight because I didn't want you to miss your supper. Uh, <laughs> any questions about Alexander or anything else we've talked about? And there they sat stunned for some moments. Okay. No questions? Think you know everything about Alexander now? Excellent. What was the name of his horse? Eucephalus. Eucephalus. Okay, you're ready. Thank you all very much. Thank you.